everybody. Welcome. I would really appreciate you donning masks and being here. And we have a bunch of people on Zoom. My name is Anat Mati. I'm a finance and economics professor here at the Business School and faculty director of the Corporation Society Initiative, CASI, which is sponsoring this event. CASI now in its fourth year engages on issues at the intersection of markets, business, government, and society to promote good governance, accountability, and trust. We engage in many ways in all communities of the business school and much beyond to broaden and deeper the discussion. We conduct research, education, policy work to try to ensure the institutions and government structures serve society. CAS is a collaborative effort of faculty, staff, and students. Uh, we're very grassroots, not we're not a club, and we have five enthusiastic second year uh, student leaders, one of whom Anna Zimmerman is going to moderate today's discussion. Another one is Matt Devine, who's not supposed to monitor the, the Zoom, and I hope we show up. Uh, <laughs> um, which we're excited and honored to host Representative Rokana, who will be introduced later, generously spending a few hours here today uh, at GSB, including engaging with students in class just uh, next door until uh, a few minutes ago. And uh, we're also honored to uh, have Dean John Levin here, who is going to introduce our visitor and uh, who interacted with a, a Representative Kana in the previous life for both of them, where uh, John Levin uh, was a chairman of the economics department, and the representative uh, Kana was a lecturer uh, giving uh, classes here. Uh, this is a, a big week. This is the third uh, event of Cassie this week. All of them have something to do with digital um, world that we all live in and various issues around that from a book on cold system error to cybersecurity, to spreading digital opportunities and internet regulation, et cetera. Um, and all three of them are being recorded. Next week, we have one more on China, capitalism, and the media with an expert uh, journalist who has a media outlet on China. I highly urge you to come to that Thursday at noon. It will not be recorded. Uh, what you can count on in CASI events is thoughtful discussion, big picture, and elevating the debate on important issues concerning the interaction of all our institutions. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to call in Dean John Levy to introduce our speaker. Thank you all. So first of all, thank you, Anat, and thanks to Anat and Paul Fletcher, who are faculty directors of CASI and who have, have uh, built it up into quite a fantastic institution at the school and for the amazing events this week and all through the quarter. And it's just great to be able to have this series at the GSB and to be the center of discussion on such a set of important topics as they've selected this year. Um, and now I get the pleasure of introducing Ro Kana. Ro, great to see you. Uh, it's uh, it's really wonderful to have uh, to have Ro join us. Ro is, as you know, the congressman for the 17th district of California. So he doesn't actually cover Stanford, but he's got some of us. Uh, and um, and I guess off to the uh, to the east as well, including in fact parts of Santa Clara County, although not our part. And um, so Rose started his career as a lawyer, and he served in the Obama administration uh, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce from 2000 to 2011. And when he finished working in the Obama administration, he came back here to Silicon Valley, and he was working as a lawyer at Wilson Sonsini, one of the local firms. And at that time, I was fortunate to hire him as a lecturer in the Department of Economics, and he taught a class about economic policy for a number of years and was just was a wonderful person to have at Stanford. And then we fortunately or unfortunately lost him to the US uh, Congress <laughs> in, uh, in, um, in 2016, which was a, a, a big loss for Stanford students, but a big win for the country and, uh, and for our area. And uh, he's now in his third term, and he has been 
you know, in that time, just risen to be an incredibly forceful advocate in Congress for, you know, first of all, for advancing U.S. innovation and technological leadership and a really needed voice, uh, and particularly importance is coming from Silicon Valley in this area. And secondly, for ensuring that advances in innovation and technology are widely shared in the country. And probably, you know, in many ways, the leading person in Congress for thinking about how the benefits of innovation can be and should be diffused throughout the entire country. And he's advanced that in a whole set of ways, sponsoring the Endless Frontier Act to create a new director in the National Science Foundation. He's sponsored legislation around the H1B process. He's encouraged the extension of venture capital, technology jobs across the country into the Midwest. And he's got a new book on dignity in the digital age, which you're going to think hear a lot about. And so please join me in welcoming my friend Rohana to the GSP. Thank you. I'm sorry that John left out, but I'll email him for advice once every, yeah. every three months. So you don't that. necessarily get it, but. No, I think <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dean Levin, and thank you all for being here today. Um, but most importantly, Ro, thank you for joining us for a, a marathon of a morning and an afternoon. And um, so as Dean Levin mentioned, there are so many things that we could talk about today. Um, you've really been on the forefront of almost every topic in the congressional life guide from climate change to Medicare for all to the internet over. Um, but I think today for the first part of our conversation, with my hair. I uh, would love to focus on uh, spreading digital opportunities and an internet bill of rights. And then I think very quickly we'll try and open it up to the audience for I, what I hope will be a very engaging QA. Um, so I'll just kick us off with an overview question. You spend quite a bit of time outside your home district talking about spreading digital opportunities. So broadly, how can Silicon Valley and policymakers create more digital opportunities around the country and what does success look like for you? Well, thank you. First, thank you, Anna. Thank you to Matt for inviting me, and John, and thank you for uh, turning out. So I uh, represent a district uh, that has Apple, Google, Intel, Yahoo, Cisco, LinkedIn, all in uh, our uh, geography. The uh, market cap of tech companies in this area is $11 trillion. It increased by 40%. Uh, over the course of the pandemic. And you have, as I had mentioned in the previous class, since 2008, rural American communities that have seen basically uh, stagnant uh, wealth, if not declining wealth. We have the racial wealth gap at uh, 10 to 1 for uh, black families compared to white families, for Latino families compared to white families and a racial wealth generation gap. There will be 25 million digital jobs in 2025. That's more than construction and manufacturing combined. So as a basic premise, uh, my view is that you can't have all of the jobs and wealth generation concentrated in certain geographies, that you have to have uh, a dispersion of these opportunities uh, in rural America, in black and brown communities, uh, to allow them people to stay in their hometown if they so choose, uh, to have a way of life that they uh, want and to have access to modern wealth generation. And so while I had done a lot of work uh, in my district, of course, that uh, was allowing me to be in Congress, uh, they have been supportive of this effort in getting uh, modern wealth generation into uh, these communities and opportunities. And we can discuss the difficulties. I think it's uh, pretty easy or easier to think about how we get 20, 30 jobs, pay $80,000 in these communities. It's much harder to think about how we're actually going to generate large wealth in these communities or create entrepreneurial ecosystems, which are much, much harder to do. Yeah, I, I would love to dive into that a little bit. So I think a lot of the digital opportunities you talked about, you know, just broadly and even in class earlier around jobs and you know, putting a, a Google job in Kentucky will still contribute to app or to Alphabet wealth in, in Mountain View, right? And so is there more to spreading the success of Silicon Valley than just moving jobs to different parts of the country? Do you think the concentration of digital power in Silicon Valley is just more good than harm? What are some of the challenges to, to spreading wealth? 
Well, first thing is that not all of these jobs have to be for Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft. So they're very, very difficult. But the reason I have focused on some of them, so Google, we're working with Google actually in pilot projects in uh, Jefferson, Iowa, in an HBCU in South Carolina, at UNLV in Nevada, and a, a community college in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, is that they have such large brands, like the Stanford brand, uh, that when you go and even if you create 15, 20 jobs in these communities, and you work with the community college to do that, you get a few benefits. Well, you get a good curriculum out of it because a lot of the uh, curriculum uh, is not uh, designed around the country to actually uh, prepare for the jobs that are going to exist. So you get uh, the curriculum, you get an entire community uh, really believing, and now their kids may be able to stay and have opportunity. And it's, it's amazing to me how 10, 15 jobs in towns of 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 uh, often transform uh, a community. You know, when we did it in Jefferson, I know the governor showed up. If you created 10 jobs in my district, it'd be hard for me to get a city council member uh, to show up. So uh, they have an ex extraordinary impact. But the, the jobs then, once you have the curriculum, should be tailored to the local industry. I mean, the, the, the premise of why you get the 25 million digital jobs, uh, which was a study uh, in part by Brad Smith and Microsoft that, that you can look up, uh, is because almost every company is going to have components of a digital architecture, a digital design, uh, of uh, a technology component, whether that's in agriculture, or manufacturing, or retail. And so a lot of those jobs can be around uh, the local industry. And you're saying you don't have to have all of those jobs be outside the community, that those jobs can be done by people in the community and they uh, have access to uh, uh, revenue coming in. So uh, Hal Rogers, who's at Catesville, he says, look, with coal, we used to have an export and we have revenue coming in. We need other things that are going to bring in revenue as opposed to just uh, having us uh, not have uh, occupations that are going to bring that in. So uh, now, I, as I alluded in class earlier, I, I'm not of the view that we can somehow just pop up and replicate uh, Silicon Valley all across the country. And, you know, and, and Rico Moretti's work and others show how difficult to do that. And so let's just stipulate that there are going to be large nodes, large hubs of wealth generation. That doesn't mean that the rest of the country has to be totally barren in terms of uh, economic activity. We can have small hubs, we can have uh, different types of access to middle class jobs, and you may have some cases entrepreneurship that emerges. Uh, but I think we need to do just a much better job than currently where so much is left out. I think another sort of related question to, to the job topic is government talent. Um, recent congressional hearings have been right with sound bites from representatives asking alphabet executives about the next iPhone design, to senators asking Mark Zuckerberg how Facebook makes money. Um, what can we do to combat technological literacy in Congress? And I think a related question is how do we strengthen pipelines of technological talent, maybe from some people in this room um, into government. How many people in this room think that at some point they didn't want to serve in government? That's very encouraging. That's really encouraging. Uh, it is something that we need desperately more of. Uh, we are technologically illiterate, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, and that's that's not uh, you know uh, an exaggeration. I mean, there is not the technological competence of the FTC. There's not the technological competence of Congress. I believe there's not the technological competence in the EU. And you talk to these companies, they're running circles around it. They don't mind coming to Congress, getting yelled at, having uh, at these hearings if there's not if there's not an actual regulation. And they are able to have dark patterns to, to get consent on uh, uh, manipulating around regulations. They are uh, able to. Uh, uh, you, we don't have the right questions even that, to know what, how we are going to regulate, for example, if we are algorithms that are uh, targeting teenagers and possibly causing depression or anxiety, you have to actually understand what questions to ask. I don't know, and I represent Silicon Valley and I have through osmosis, and I don't have that kind of technical knowledge. So uh, we need uh, it desperately in the United States government to both for Congress and the FTC to beef up our technology uh, department. I think hiring out of places like Silicon Valley, we need people like you all to be willing uh, to serve and to think about what, what's in the, the public interest. And you don't have to do it for your own lives, 
but doing it for a few years, I think, would be, be tremendous. And that is uh, something that the government desperately needs. I'd love to pivot a little bit to the Internet Bill of Rights, which is the signature issue of yours. Um, so it would be great if you could just tell us overall about the Internet Bill of Rights, how it came to be, your vision for the work, and sort of key challenges you see in passing legislation. Uh, Speaker Pelosi asked me to draft it after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. The reason the Cambridge Analytica scandal hit people so hard, at least in Congress, was it was a sense that you now were being manipulated to, to support something that you totally didn't believe. Right? It was uh, that your data was being taken and manipulated into a model that was in some way aiding uh, Donald Trump, and that you didn't even know about that, and this is the level of, of manipulation. And so the, uh, the speaker said we'd have to, to do something about this, and the Internet Bill of Rights is some very simple principles that uh, you should have to opt in uh, before uh, and, and, and consent before your data is, is, uh, is collected. Uh, you should have the uh, ability to know what's happening to your data. So if we had that, for example, you could have had nonprofits that could have had data requests into Facebook and would have known what was actually taking place uh, with their data. There should be some fiduciary responsibility that these companies have uh, with data. And it goes through a number of basic principles uh, that are uh, necessary to make sure that not just the government, but the private sector isn't manipulating uh, information about you in ways that, that you don't want. Now, the implementation of this, I think, requires a lot of technical expertise, and there are a lot of uh, detailed questions in, in how it's implemented, which is why I think we also need the uh, technical expertise in, in doing it. Great. A final question for me. Um, as Dean mentioned, uh, Levin mentioned, you have an upcoming book coming <laughs> out called Dignity in a Digital Age, Making Tech Work for All of Us. I hope I got that right. Um, we're sitting here in a room on Stanford campus in the heart of Silicon Valley. Many of us here, I think, came from tech or will touch tech or maybe government uh, in our future careers. What would you challenge us to do as future leaders in this space to make tech work better for all of us? Let me say two things. One is that there has to be an ethics that emerges in technology platforms as stakeholders of democracy. One of the favorite articles that I read uh, is Jürgen Habermas, who's a, a, a political philosopher, coined the, the phrase public sphere. And he in, wrote an article in 1964 where he described newspapers. And there's a line that stuck with me for 20 years ever since I read that article. And he said, newspapers have a commercial basis, but they're not fully commercialized. In other words, yes, they have to make money, but that's not the only thing that they care about. And from that emerged an entire ethics over it took years, but it emerged an ethics of, of journalism, of what is the newspaper's role uh, in, in democracy. Now, that doesn't mean it was easy. You know, people would keep up the printing press. After the printing press, there were probably hundreds of years of war and terrible pamphlets and inciting violence. And it took a long time before sort of we figured out the institutions of liberal democracy. So the internet is just that it's incipient. But all of you, some of you who may go into leading companies, I think you have obviously an obligation on the profits and leading the company. But you also, in my view, should recognize that now these companies are stakeholders of democracy. And you have an obligation to think about what that company's role is in promoting democracy. And the government can't do it because of the First Amendment. I mean, we can do certain things, but we can't, we can't, it's not the uh, the government that makes sure that newspapers don't just print it, it by and large blatant lies or that there's some sense of that they have to get multiple sources. That's a, an ethics that has emerged after years. And so thinking about what does that look like in platforms that now or the new platforms are for democratic discourse, I think is one thing. And the second thing is thinking about what are you going to be able to do to create more opportunity for participation in the modern economy, uh, regardless of geography, race, gender. One of the problems I think that we have as a Democratic Party is we often talk about redistribution post-production. So we'll produce all this wealth, then we'll tax it, and then we'll redistribute it. 
But the harder question, that, and that's important. I mean, there's important roles for redistribution. But the harder question, in my view, is how do we have deep distribution of opportunity prior to the production? How do we get more people participating in the economy? And as business leaders, uh, you will have that opportunity to look for talent in places that may not be conventional, to take risks that may not be uh, conventional. And, and, I, and I hope you will. Thank you, Ro, for that challenge. Um, I'll turn it now over to the audience. I think any question is fair game. Ask him anything. And Ro, you feel, feel free to call him. Thank you for uh, coming, Ro. Very much appreciated. I actually wanted to pick up on something that you just said, specifically like when, when um, any of us are leading companies, leading businesses, and so forth in the future, how can we promote certain ideals, First Amendment you no noted, and so forth, uh, of the company? But many of the companies that we're talking about are multinational. And I also have parents who, are, who immigrated from India and the ethics or the norms are different in a lot of different nations. And in some of those cases, there are colonial histories of companies that are pushing certain principles that might not necessarily fully align with those of the population on the ground. How do you think about those questions? Very, very challenging and very, uh thoughtful question. Let me first say why I think, and, I, and this is, I think, influenced partly because I've had more time to think about it. I'll give a very answer that I gave in the first class at the advantage of the second round. So why, why, I, why I think that business leaders should think about uh, ethics in, in, in their lives. Imagine if as a politician, I said to you, you asked me, why do you make a decision? And I said, well, I, all I'm doing is maximizing my chances of maximizing the vote share in the next election. And if every answer you asked me, and I said that as the answer, why are you for this policy? Well, I think it will maximize my vote share from 66% to 68%. Uh, I'll tell you this. I mean, even as calculating as politicians are, uh, that's, not, that's not the whole equation. Right? I mean, I've seen people who have a especially if they have a kid who has, let's say, diabetes or something, and they'll be passionate about that. So don't lose your humanity in your obligation as citizens, and your obligation as people, to just one part of your identity. Bring the entire identity, bring your whole facet to your identity and the role that you have. And I think we expect that of our elected leaders. And so why wouldn't we expect that of our business leaders? Now, I think there are definitely conflicts in terms of the ethics in terms of other, other countries. Let me give you an easy case where I think maybe I'll be a little controversial. When you, when you have Facebook in some of these countries like India, and you have a co-option of the platform in play with a, a brutal suppression of minority rights, uh, brutal suppression of Muslims and, and Sikhs, and uh, turning a blind eye in some cases to that, I think that that's wrong. I think that there has to be, uh, in my view, if you're an American company, uh, a commitment to at least basic principles of liberalism and pluralism uh, across the world, and that in, in Myanmar or, or in India or other parts of the country. That said, I think that there should be a sensitivity uh, to uh, the local uh, a local community and local culture as well. And you can't just have the view that everything that we believe is, is true. Uh, and this is why I think, you know, business leaders have the same philosophical questions as political leaders. You know, people have been thinking of this for generations. What are the trade-offs between universal values and particular values? You know, and Marcus has written a whole book on, on, on these questions. Uh, and, and why, uh, but those are the types of decisions you'll have to make. That, there's not one right answer, but I'll tell you what's wrong is not to think about it or be aware of it uh, as you're making those, those decisions. So pretty much all that you've uh, discussed about the role of corporations is what, as uh, MBA ones, we've been studying in our ethics class. And uh, you speak about the role of, stake, uh, of corporations as stakeholders in a democracy. It of course requires corporations to take a long-term view of what they are. And um, I'm reminded of John Galbraith's uh, book, uh, The Affluent Society, in which he says that it is only in the long term that a corporation lives. However, we have generations of people after that who have just read Milton Friedman. <laughs> and even today, 
it is required reading for an MBA student to read Milton Friedman, or an article which was written in the 1970s. Well, it should be a part of, I mean, it's just, it's a good education if you didn't read it, and I don't, I don't agree with it, but yeah, it's good to read it. My point is that when we say that we must uphold values of liberalism and liberal plural pluralistic values, it basically mostly requires corporations to self-regulate. And uh, how do you think that that can that that really play that can really play out? How do you make corporations self-regulate? I don't think that it's a, it's a good question. I don't think that what I'm saying is that we just need self-regulation of corporations. There definitely is a role for the state to regulate and the state to regulate smart What I'm saying is that we have a particularly difficult challenge of regulating technology because of the lack of uh, technological knowledge, but we still need regulations. We need regulations on smart regulations on antitrust. We need smart regulations on privacy. Uh, we need smart regulations about uh, social media forms. But you know, the problem why we don't get regulations in social media forms is both the Democrats and Republicans believe that it should be regulated, the Republicans believe that it should be regulated to have no censorship, and the Democrats want to kick things off. So they they both want the opposite extreme or opposite thing. Uh, but of course we need regulation. But my view is that in a democracy, in a democratic society, a government and government regulation, uh, especially in a place of a private enterprise system, is never sufficient to have a healthy society. You can never have sufficient regulation by government uh, to say that this is going to uphold a, a, a vibrant democracy. You need a vibrant civil sector. You need a vibrant educational sector. You need a vibrant private sector that thinks about their, their, their values to, to the country. And if you don't have that, then maybe you can prevent the worst excesses through regulation, but you can't have a healthy democracy. And I just, uh, and, and especially in American society where the government has a circumcised sphere, we have large spheres that are not government actors. And uh, the, the hope would be that uh, the, the leaders of those institutions would have some sense of uh, obligation to, to, to the country, to the world, to, to uh, community. And by the, way, by the way, I think a lot do. It, it, a lot, you know, I think there's a cynicism almost that says that that upholds the, the, the sense of the, the ruthless person who's going to only look at uh, maximization of self interest. I think maybe there are a few people that maybe there have been excess cases of that, but most people I meet that's not their natural instinct. Now, many of us may succumb more to the temptation than our ideal. But we should acknowledge that complexity, and we should, in my view, acknowledge that we need good leadership in all these spheres for our country to thrive. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, imagine in some not so distant future, the whole Congress and Senate is replaced by AI. By what? AI, <laughs> artificial <laughs> intelligence. So we took all the best engineers, some of them your constituents, um, <laughs> develop a policy. Uh, which will maximize long-term interest of the whole U.S. society. What do you think will be the outcome of this AI model in regards to tax? Well, I hope we don't live in that world which replaces uh, human judgment and, and, and human emotion. I mean, I think AI can be wonderful in helping us uh, understand complex data, and maybe we can have platforms that involve uh, that help get more people involved in weighing in on decisions so that maybe AI could help uh, all of you in uh, a democracy participate and then have that information uh, towards uh, towards governance. But uh, AI is not going to, in my view, solve questions of what is the obligation of uh, us uh, to the United States versus the sensitivity to other countries, like you're going to ask. It's not going to solve questions of values. It's going to, uh, it, it, it may organize information, uh, but ultimately it's still a debate, in my view, about values. And the question of tax, in my view, is much more a question of, uh, of values than it is a question of uh, precision. It is a question of uh, what do we think is the proper uh, obligation of a society, a government to provide uh, for its citizens? What do we and what do we think is the appropriate 
uh, amount that we can ask citizens to pay to do that. Now, there could be a lot of data maybe that can inform that. Maybe we could say, hey, if the raise tax is this much, then you may generate less revenue, you may generate more revenue. Uh, and all of that, maybe AI can help us get better uh, information on. But I don't think that it will take away that fundamental values question, which is what do you think is a role that people should uh, have in, in providing uh, for, for people? And, and what do you... Uh, uh, what do you think is the appropriate uh, level of tax? Hi, Congressman. Thanks for coming today. My name is Kyle, a uh, second year grad student in international policy. I, I really like the uh, point you made on trying to, you know, redistribute opportunity prior to production. And that makes me think about our pipeline. Uh, so specifically when it comes to education, I've noticed living here for the past year with my family, you know, the opportunities for community college and, and technical schools are are robust and it's certainly, I think, a step in the right direction for helping the pipeline. Uh, but like my hometown in Indiana, pretty poor community, hit hard by the opioid crisis. Uh, how do you know regions like that do do better with bringing secondary education, in the form of community college, technical schools, to the forefront? Is this potentially a national level discussion, or or is this state and local challenge? I, I, I appreciate that. I think it's absolutely a national level discussion. I, I said, you know, we also have the land grant universities, which were created for preparing people in agriculture and mechanical arts. We ought to be refashioning them to also have a section of preparing people for the modern economy. And we can do that also with community college. I'm obviously totally supportive of the president's plan. Uh, well, this is now out, but I was supportive of the president's plan to have community colleges be free. But what is Equally important is for community colleges to be resourced with the right partnerships with the private sector uh, to be able to have the right curriculum and partnerships to have uh, pathways to job creation. One of the reasons we have such vibrant community colleges here is, in my view, because of the access to a lot of the companies here, a lot of access to a lot of the universities here. And think about it now in a digital age with so many things being uh, online and so much of the learning being online. You could really have partnerships where you have the best curriculum at these community colleges with the partnerships of the private sector, uh, and we're doing that across across the country. Uh, and that ought to be a huge priority, and it ought to be a priority not just that you need a four-year degree. Uh, you could get a, a nine a nine month course, and often that could lead to a to a good job. So uh, you know, I think here there should be an intersection. The Democrats talk about the resources, which are very very important. The Republicans also talk about the, the private sector, and what we ought to do is have the resources, but also the collaboration, so that we're having good outcomes. Uh, the earlier discussion on uh, soft regulation and uh, what you just said about collaboration between the private sector and, and uh, education and resources is making me think about the difference between cooperation and compliance. Maybe compliance being more from the, the viewpoint of regulation and enforcement and legislation, and cooperation from the viewpoint of maybe a uh, feeling of civic responsibility uh, on behalf of the corporation to have uh, the opportunities to maybe take some more risks and not just maximize the, the profit margins or something like that. But what I'm wondering is, you know, do you see a culture of civic responsibility in the corporate world? And if not, how can we help bring that about? Because I don't think, well, from my limited perspective, it doesn't seem like the corporations are uh, doing it on their own. Well, I'm not sure you can pay through all, all corporations in the same direction, nor do I, nor do I think you can sort of pay to uh, all the tech with the same brush. If, if, there, if the question is, could there be more corporate responsibility and, uh, and consideration of uh, society and the society's implications? Of course, that, 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 that is true. And similarly, you could say, you know, members of Congress ought to care more about the country and not just uh, partisan politics. Uh, so. Uh, of course, that is uh, the case, and the hope would be that uh, that you would look at uh, a few areas where you, where you could make uh, an, an impact in in whatever area you, you go into. Let me tell you one area where I think technology companies have done well. I think they, you know, ten years ago, there was not as much awareness for the janitors and bus drivers and the service workers, and some of the uh, union organizing coupled with the decisions of uh, companies uh, has now led to much higher wages for many people in 
uh, in those in those professions. They probably could do more, and we could do collectively more for housing in in this uh, area. Uh, one place that they're again making progress is now they're funding you know the Sunny Hills uh, Community Services Center. I just said yesterday, uh, LinkedIn and Google both gave a million dollars. That was not common ten years ago. So uh, the, the move, in my view, is in the right in the right direction, and I think you could bring more of that those values of climate, on, on philanthropy. But I think the biggest questions are, what are you going to do in terms of the uh, architecture in some cases of these, these platforms? Uh, you know, what is, is especially the platforms that have implications for democratic discourse. And what are you going to do in terms of the, the ability to search for and retain talent and, uh, and make that a priority uh, for your company? Uh, and so uh, I, I'm optimistic that uh, your generation will uh, take that, have that, uh, those issues uh, at top of mind. Hi, Anthony, I'm Baby Tag, but I'm Julianne. I'm an MBA too. Um, following up on Kyle's question a little bit, I'm really sitting with knowing that being at Stanford, like in this kind of bubble, I'm very aware of not only that I need to have like an ethic or philosophy around um, what tech companies role in the future is, but why that matters so much and what the, like how it will impact. I'm also from Missouri and super aware that a lot of the communities that I grew up in do not think about this day to day and that like the impacts that you're describing don't have an impact on what they view as most important right now or where their political priorities lie. So I guess I'm curious one, how you think about Congress's role in educating voters in spaces like this on long term, this does have a huge impact on you, and right now it does. So how do you educate voters on how to think about it? Um, and where, where where do you think your role in that is? So I guess that's my first question, my, my main question. I think you're right to say that a lot of the country views tech is sort of distant and, 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 and disconnected. They're aware, though, that's where a lot of the modern welfare rates is taking place. I mean, they, they read the same headlines that, that you or I do. And they think, well, that's not for us. That's not for our kids. Uh, my experience has been, uh, obviously, I didn't grow up. I grew up in Buck County, Pennsylvania, which is more suburban Pennsylvania than rural. But my experience has been that when you go to these communities, and if you go concretely with actual opportunity and jobs, and not just rhetoric, and those jobs are created, then there's a lot of excitement and a warm sense of uh, enthusiasm towards that. Uh, Dorsey actually has done some of that stuff in Missouri because he's from there and he's, he's funded initiatives. He's had Twitter actually locate some of its uh, employee base before the pandemic. Started. And my sense is that that is, uh, is very meaningful. But if, you're, if it's just theoretical, if it's just, you know, kind of after talking about climate change and green jobs, I don't think that connects. Or you're saying, let's invest in community colleges. I think you have to really bring the community in to participate. And it can't be one of, uh, we're going to tell you what to do. It's got to be more of partnering and thinking about uh, their own, uh, own role in it. Uh, it to, to, uh, to help uh, give them a second, to have those communities a sense that they're participating in, in the future. And then in terms of the impact on, uh, on, on, on democracy of digital platforms, I, I also agree that there isn't uh, that much, uh, sufficient awareness, but that awareness is growing. I mean, it's growing after the Facebook average scandal, after January 6th, after uh, on the conservative side, issues of censorship. So people are realizing that these platforms have uh, in, in increasing power. And I think that that awareness is only going to grow over the next few years, where the country says, "Yeah, we have to really uh, tackle these these complicated questions." Thank you so much for taking the time today, Congressman. It's especially exciting for me as a District 17 Fremont native. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. So, um, I want to. My questions are on climate change, where you've been a leader over the last few years. I think the infrastructure bill puts a start to addressing some of the concerns, but given the timeline. 10, 20 years of seeing a really important problem. Uh, I'm curious how you're thinking about fighting this, especially uh, given climate's partisan kind of nature. And second, what advice would you give to someone like me that wants to help and fight? Is that on the policy side? Is that corporations and startups, nonprofits, or or like whatever else? Maybe one of the will come in CFX office. I'll tell you, <laughs> I, I know not if you don't want to do it, but the, uh, you know, I was surprised when we had the, uh, 
CEO's first time ever they testified before my committee. And Darren Woods, the uh, chairman and CEO of VP Shell. And here's what struck me as surprising. Exxon was unwilling, Darren Woods was unwilling to admit that any past statement that any executive had made was inconsistent with their understanding of the science at the time. I mean, I read to him and others read to him CEOs who said that fossil fuel burning does not cause climate change. And he was unwilling to say that that was a false statement at the time. It would be literally as a as said, it would be like the President Biden defending Andrew Johnson's comments. I mean, no, we, he's an American president. We just have to defend him as understanding of the time. So the first question is how are we going to get these huge actors uh, to understand responsibility of what has happened in the past and they engage in huge climate disinformation. I mean, New York Times editorial saying that climate change may not exist, even though they knew the science was wrong. And then what can we do to get them to be sort of visionary about the future? And by that, I mean, you know, obviously right now they're maximizing their profits by uh, engaging in increased oil production, but the European companies are not. BP and Shell actually are reducing uh, their oil production and transitioning much more heavily into renewable energy. And how do we, yes, we can have the regulatory framework, which Congress is trying to do, uh, and uh, Build Back Better does in a significant way, massive investments in renewable energy, massive investments in electric vehicles uh, to try to bring the cost of electric vehicles down, bring the cost of batteries down so that it can be affordable for the working class. But uh, we also need the private sector, some people to take a leap of faith or to say, look, the long term 20 year plan for our companies uh, require this, and to be able to sell that for the board, to the board. I guess here's the, the point if, uh, if leadership didn't matter and it was simply about maximizing shareholder value uh, for the short term, why couldn't you have computers be CEOs? You know, the whole point is of leadership is to balance the short-term obligations, and no one is saying you can't care about your quarterly earnings, of course you have to care about them, with what are the bets you can take for the long-term. And different leaders come to it with different perspectives, but that's the, that's the challenge, that's what makes it exciting, that's what makes it uh, having a mark. And the question is, what will our private sector do? I would say our private sector is not uh, as far along on climate in the aggregate uh, as Europe uh, is, and we need to keep developing that culture. Hi, I'm Angela. Um, I was wondering if um, our um, outside reliance on the philanthropy of like big tech and like individual donors bothers you, because we talk a lot about civic responsibility of big tech, but if government was able to use the funds and enact it the way for the people, we wouldn't need big tech philanthropy in the first place. So does the outside sort of influence of big tech in gov on government map is, is does that bother me? Is that the, the question? Yes. Uh, so for example, I think Facebook has built affordable housing for teachers, but if the state of California were able to build that housing in the first place, Facebook wouldn't need to, and we could better serve constituents from the government without relying on private companies' own um, certain motivation. No, I agree with you. I mean, I'm, 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 I certainly think the government has a strong role. I mean, I'm not for a view that the uh, the uh, basic obligations uh, of uh, what, is, what are required for a decent life should be the obligations of the private sector. I think the government has a role to provide everyone with health care. The government has a role to provide everyone with education. And the government has a role uh, to, to give people the opportunity, at least, to housing uh, and, and, and having a place to, 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 to live uh, in, a, in a safe neighborhood. But, you know, and I'm, I'm Happy to to, 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 to to raise tax tax on uh, the wealthy to, to be able to pay for those uh, basic for the government to do that. But the question is first, when the government fails to, to do all of that, and no society is perfect, no government is perfect, uh, is there a role for individuals, uh, community leaders, educational institutions, private sector institutions to help fill the void? I would argue there is, and that's why we have philanthropy in part. And, and then the second point is that even absent filling the void of, uh, of the state, uh, you have large action that's taking place in the private sector. 
uh, large action in terms of who has opportunities of wealth generation. Uh, what do these platforms look like? Uh, what is the environment in the workplace? You can't regulate everything. You can't regulate uh, a workplace that gives people meaning, dignity, and, uh, and, and a sense of purpose. I mean, I can't write those regulations. And yet most people spend their time at work, right? I mean, uh, you can't regulate what it's like to be in a classroom, and yet there's some good classes and bad classes. So what is the obligation of those participating in non-government spheres to uh, uplift society by having those spheres be as uh, concerned about the public good, which doesn't mean that that's the only thing they should be concerned about, but it ought to be one of their considerations uh, in, in, in leading those institutions. Congressman, thanks for your time. Uh, I'm a Sloan fellow here, uh, and this question had bothered me in my whole career before coming back to the GSB. Uh, I have an experience in surveillance technology in smart cities, so it ties in opt-in privacy and ethics together. And I've always seen that there are always two sides of thoughts here. There is one that's the nothing to hide around privacy. So I opt in equally and fully all the time. And there's the other faction which thinks privacy represents freedom of choice. And so it cannot be taken for granted. As, as we become, as cities become smarter, these technologies will encroach on user privacy, citizen privacy. But how do you use opt-in as not a biased position? Because initially opt-in, all the people who think this is, I have nothing to hide, opt in openly and 100%. But then how do we make this digital policy regulation effective and inclusive at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think the opt in is one of the criteria. First of all, it has to be informed opt in so that people need to understand what the consequences are, what the consequences could be to, to, to their data. Because I think a lot of people sort of opt in without fully understanding all of that. And then uh, it's unclear to me that that's sufficient, that there, there need to be other, uh, uh, other protections and, and regulations. For example, uh, a lot of these companies can create profiles of individuals without getting everyone's data. They just need a micro subset of the data, and then they can predict uh, profiles and, and, and target ads. So uh, we may need broader regulations about what you can do with data and what you can't do with data. Uh, regardless of whether you're collecting it to opt in or not. One could be, for example, the minimal use of data, that you shouldn't be using data more for purposes other than the service you're providing. So I, I just think that opt in is one aspect of it, but for the reasons you pointed out, uh, it may be of use. People who, are, who don't want to pay a financial cost may say, I'm going to just opt in and get a free service. So it has to be coupled, in my view, with other regulatory. Uh, Hi, my name is Yulia. I'm a fellow of Ukrainian Emerging Leaders Program, and I worked in Ukraine on policy making and science innovation. I wonder uh, about uh, Endless Frontier Act. Uh, it, do you think it's an uh, optimal policy instrument in order to help the US uh, meet the challenges of technological era, competing with China, and so on? Is its design optimal? I mean, to include in an asset technology and so on. And also, uh, do you think, what can you say about its future? Is it easy to write such questions in the Congress and so on? Well, I'm biased in terms of the author of this. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 unbiased answer. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the policy is look, it's the largest investment in science and technology uh, that our government has made since the 1960s. It's in the critical technology areas of, uh, uh, of, of uh, AI, quantum computing, synthetic biology, semiconductors, uh, clean technology. So these are all areas we need. It's saying that we don't just need uh, theoretical uh, science, but we need some practical applications uh, also funded. And uh, President Reef at MIT actually was very thoughtful about this. He said, well, most theoretical innovations uh, require some practical applications as well. There are very few Albert Einsteins, and maybe he doesn't need a lab, but most people, the Nobel laureates, need uh, practical uh, science, which also then fuels the theoretical science. And so this uh, idea that NSF is going to now fund both the theoretical but also some uh, practical applications, I think, is, is a huge, huge advance. 
Uh, and you know, it all depends. We have to get the vote of the house. I'm hopeful, but uh, you know, until it's done, it's not done. And then they decided to bring these tech centers across the country. Matter. And this was a great debate that in Ben Auer Bush, who wrote on those frontiers, which basically said that this is what's going to give the United States a uh, competitive advantage. There was a senator from West Virginia, actually, who said, uh, no, you know, we shouldn't just be giving it to all the Stanfords and the MITs and the Caltech. We ought to be giving it more regionally distributed. And he lost that debate back then. Ben Auer Bush wins the debate, and we get most of the first science money goes to pretty elite universities. Which is probably, you know, which also has led to our scientific advancement. But now we have more distributed, uh, uh, more distributed uh, talent across universities. So this is saying let's distribute some of that funding regionally and 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 locally. And you don't have to argue that that's going to be the most economically efficient. Who knows? You know, I mean, I, I I'm not going to say that I know for a fact that if we're distributing the money more regionally and more. Uh, based on different parts of the country, that that is more economically efficient than if we gave all the money to MIT. I mean, I, I don't know. But what I do know is this, it'll build a broader coalition for supporting science in this country. It'll help bring more people into the economic participation of our democracy. It'll give more people opportunity. And so on balance, uh, I think it's worthwhile policy. Thank, thank you for joining us today, Congressman. Uh, my name is Chris Tom. I'm a second-year MBA student here and also one of the student leaders of the Preparation Society Initiative. My question is around this notion of an inclusive digital future. Um, where we've seen sort of secondary digital hubs uh, pop up around the country in places like Austin, one of the sort of uh, side effects of that has been an increase in the cost of living that has left the local working class behind. And having done my undergrad, uh, time in Austin at the University of Texas, I saw firsthand people were no longer able to afford the apartments they had lived in for years. How do we how do we ensure that, you know, given that not everybody will be able to have one of these new digital jobs, that the rest of the folks in the economy are still able to fully participate and you know enjoy their livelihood? It's a great question. It's a, it's a great question. It's um... I think, uh, you know, there, there are real economists in Brooks. I, I hesitate to say this, and maybe they can correct me afterwards. But I think it's one of the uh, one of the challenges, actually, in like the tech multiplier analysis. So Moretti says, okay, every tech job is going to create four other good jobs, and they're all going to be high paid jobs. But what isn't factored in often is, well, are those jobs uh, going to make up for the increased cost of living? And in some cases, uh, you know, you have to go, go just look at San Jose. Yeah, there's been a multiplier effect and they've been good jobs. But for many of the service workers, 57% uh, of their income is going to, to rent. And there wasn't, in my view, sufficient consideration of, well, what does this mean for housing? What does this mean for wages of people who may not be uh, connected to tech? And is it really uplifting the entire region or is it uplifting 30%, 40% of that region? So I think your your uh, comments are very uh, astute and on point, and something that policymakers need to address. Whether that is in supporting unionization to make sure that the service workers uh, in that economy are participating in the prosperity, that's one thing. Whether it's supporting much more housing so to make sure that you have, are increasing the housing supply, uh, that's another uh, policy that I think is necessary. Uh, we may need to provide more subsidy for people in uh, poor housing in addition to increasing the supply. But I agree with you your central point, which is it's not sufficient to uh, just distribute, distribute tax opportunity. We have to look at the inequality that is being generated in those ecosystems and how to address it. That is all we have time for today. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful questions and representative. Thank you so much for your time and your challenge to us.